Patrick is actually one of us. He has over 20 years of experience in the television, radio, and online, online media industry, always at the crossroads of content and technology. He is the director of media partnerships at Facebook, and that means responsibility for leading content partnerships with media companies in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And that's across news, sports, and entertainment. He has a degree in journalism from the University of Southern California. He worked with uh, NHK, which is the Japanese public service broadcaster. Yep. You've been a, a correspondent for BBC, I believe. That's right. And you worked with uh, partnerships for YouTube, and you've been in digital startups, working on both partnerships and content. Yep. So you're perfect for this. <laughs> um, we actually to asked Patrick to talk a bit about how he sees Facebook's role in society and the media business now and in the future. Yeah. How does Facebook define itself? It's very interesting because we're trying to define them all the time. And what systems do you have for controlling and regulating content? What comes to me and what doesn't come to me as a user? So uh, I would like us all to give a very warm welcome and an applause for Patrick being here. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's definitely been an interesting career journey. And it's interesting when all of this sort of comes together. Um, it's a great time to be here. It's a great time to have this conversation. I really appreciate you inviting me to join you today. Six weeks ago, a famous image was posted on Facebook. It contained child nudity, something that we do not permit on Facebook. So when people reported the image to our reviewers, we immediately took it down. That's not unusual for us. We receive over a million reports every day, a million, which means that 350 pieces of content have been uh, flagged for review by our team since I started speaking to you. In fact, this particular photo had been taken down many times before for the same reason. What was unusual was your response. The photo was reposted by dozens of publishers, people, and public figures, many who are in this room. As soon as we reviewed the image in question, we knew something was wrong. Terror of War is an iconic photograph, one that altered public opinion about the Vietnam War. It is considerable historic significance. It has a naked child in it, but yet it's clearly not pornography. It changed the course of a war, and it belongs on Facebook. So we reinstated it, and on the 21st of October, we announced a change to our policies to allow for more items that people find newsworthy, significant, or important to the public interest, even if they might otherwise violate our standards. What happened with this photo, and the part you played in bringing it to our attention, speaks to much bigger questions about Facebook's role in the world, about the future of journalism, and also about the challenges we both face. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today because I believe there are opportunities for us to work together in a way that's good for both industries and good for the world. But first, I want to take you back nearly 20 years to May 1998. I was the Southeast Asia Bureau Chief for the BBC, and I was reporting on the riots in Jakarta where the military had opened fire on unarmed students who were protesting for greater democracy. As we were scrambling to film in the chaos, I lost my cameraman, Jono, in the smoke, and that's actually me in the upper right corner. I found that this weekend. That was quite a long time ago, but I remember it very well. I had this little Nokia phone. You might remember these. It had no camera, it had no internet, definitely no video, and no satellite connection, that's for sure. And I used it to call in this report, because it was the only thing that I could do. So here's the actual report from that moment. Right now, uh, there's a mob of about two to 3,000 people. These are not students from the campus that faced off against the police yesterday. This is a crowd of young men. And they broke down the, the fences along the highway. They're making barricades, spray painting the walls. Just below me, underneath the freeway, a truck is caught on fire. The students hijacked the truck, broke the windows, and set it ablaze. Students who are... So, um, that was not the best quality, was it? That's about the best I could get, particularly at burning trucks below the bridge and uh, police officers fighting with students just nearby me. It was very intense. I later found Jono. He was bleeding from the shoulder where a bullet had grazed him, but like most news cameramen or camera women, they're pretty indestructible, and they like to get on with the job. So we found our way back through the riots to the hotel, 
We went upstairs and unpacked four very heavy metal boxes of editing equipment. You might remember some of this. Beta decks, big monitors, power source, and we started to edit an hour's worth of footage into about five minutes. Several hours later, we wound our way through the riots, the burning buildings, and several roadblocks to the broadcast center, which was the only way to send our pictures back. We were blocked by the soldiers who refused this entry. As you do often have to do in these circumstances, a few bribes later, we found ourselves upstairs, and a few bribes later, the engineers let us actually connect to the satellite and send our pictures home. We got the pictures back just in time for the BBC's 9 o'clock news. That's how you used to send pictures around for news. It was particularly difficult, and it cost thousands of dollars. Today, we could do that very same thing with one of these. For the immediacy, of course, if need be, I could do all of that with this camera, 8 megapixel camera, video, editing capabilities, satellite connectivity, it's all there. And a hell of a lot cheaper satellite connection than anything in the past. It empowers journalists. To date, it costs almost nothing for a news organization to empower their journalists with tools like these and citizens around the world for even $44 with three hours, three months of free data, you could buy the same. A one megapixel camera in that year, 1998, would have cost you $20,000. So clearly, the pace of change has been good for journalism. In the past quarter century, nearly half the world has been connected to the internet at greater and greater speeds. The pace of technological change keeps growing, and technology is evolving and is creating new opportunities for journalism. Some of the most compelling stories come from people who were previously silenced, people who now have a voice, and the means to amplify that voice for the first time. A high school student in Nigeria or a protester in the Philippines can speak to the world on their terms. In the US, the debate about police shootings has been completely changed because ordinary people using ordinary technology can now broadcast live video to everyone. Publishers and journalists are also using new technology to tell stories in new and engaging ways. On the evening of the Brexit vote, the UK's ITV network used Facebook Live to bring people into a conversation about the referendum, giving them the chance to ask questions and react to events as they unfolded. They reached 21 million people over the course of that broadcast. One year from launch, Facebook Live is now used by thousands of news organizations around the world. Here's a small sample of the innovative work that we see every day through the partnerships that we create. Hi, we're live from Beijing, China. Coming to you live from the Ijen Volcano. Live in the occupied West Bank. Live in Orlando, Florida. Wherever you are in the world, do contact us. We're going to be answering your questions live. Hundreds of people are going to be here. You'll be here too. The UK votes to leave the European Union. Freedom feels good and a little bit scary. Well, uh, we're live here on Al Jazeera Facebook. I'm Nadine Barber, and I'll be following these protesters uh, in central London. So now, to make the case for remaining in the EU, will you please welcome the Prime Minister, David Cameron? I'll turn the camera around and show you all what I'm seeing here. Those are armoured vehicles. They're using the water cannon now. We are here live from Idomeni. The is right. He's evacuating the camp. As the gunshots got closer, I tried calling 911 and it wouldn't go through. The FBI, federal authorities continue their investigation. Here we are, outside St. Stephen's, waiting for the first official statement from Theresa May. Hey, Caitlin. While I will hop up politically, fighting for our community. Please, go out and vote. You're going to be very, very happy. Welcome to the city of Longyearbyen in uh, the Norwegian High Arctic. Bonsoir à tous. Salut. J'espère que vous allez bien. Alors, on est où là Là, je mets ça dans le Journalists are also using technologies like 360 video and virtual reality to put people into situations they would otherwise never get to experience, like being in the middle of a war-torn city in Syria, as we had from Rasmus Tanholt of TV2 Denmark. And it's not just on the production side. Technology is changing consumption, too. In highly networked places like Europe, most people are online most of the time. News is no longer an event, something you read about at the breakfast table or watch after dinner. 
It's a constant, and it's something you check while you're waiting in line for a bus or an adult meeting. And it's something you share, too. The internet is more powerful, and it's a great news discovery tool, one of the greatest in history. And the conversations around news have never been stronger. So people are spending more time with news than ever before. They're engaging with new types of media content from a broader section of the global population, and they're talking about those stories with wider groups of friends, family, and even people that they don't even know. All this should mean new, new opportunities for publishers as well. But another technological change is making it harder for some newsrooms to capitalize on the opportunities of this new medium. The internet has separated creation from distribution. When something can be replicated anywhere with very little physical cost, information becomes more accessible and less able to command a premium. As bandwidth and resolution increase, different industries get disrupted. At the turn of the millennium, it was the music industry with MP3 technology, then TV with the birth of online video sites like YouTube, and then movies as broadband got fast enough to download entire films quickly. Each time, the established business model was challenged and even swept away, whether it was major record labels controlling wages and CD prices, or cable TVs charging for bundled services. And something else grew in its place, a world where musicians are much less dependent on labels and much more connected to fans, where the hottest TV series can come to Netflix before they come to broadcast television. Like you, I've watched these changes happening. But about 15 years ago, I jumped the fence. After putting down that heavy analog broadcast equipment I dragged around Asia, I moved to Europe and into the digital world and eventually found myself working for Google and then YouTube. The year was 2006. It was the year Time Magazine controversially made you the person of the year, saying, it's about the many taking power from the few and how that will not only change the world, but also change the way the world changes. And all the fears I heard from friends in my old industry were familiar. YouTube will destroy TV, what are you doing? It will be the end of original programming. Investment will crater in content. There's no future for great content anymore. None of that happened. YouTube is now just one part of a rapidly growing video ecosystem that supports creators and publishers. And I would argue that the world we're in now is much better for citizens who have more access to information, more content, more choice, and more economic power. But now that the full effects of the break between creation and distribution are being felt in the news organizations, Facebook is coming under a lot of familiar criticism. In the aftermath of the terror of war photo, people said we weren't transparent, that there's no way of knowing what our algorithms do, and that publishers don't get any warning about changes to the news feed, that we refused to accept that we were editors and were abdicating our responsibilities to the public, that we were trying to muscle in on the media business and eroding the fundamentals of journalism and the business models that support it, that by encouraging publishers to optimize for clicks and showing people what they want to see, we were creating filter bubbles and echo chambers. To start to answer some of these, I think it's useful to take a step back and look at what Facebook was actually created to do. Our mission is to give people the power to share and to make the world more open and connected. We believe that being connected is a net benefit to society, that giving more voice to more people leads to more accountability and more openness, that access to technology allows people to open up opportunities for themselves, their families, and their businesses. I've lived in the UK for 16 years, where the idea of having a company mission is deeply suspicious. My British friends suspect I've been incorporated in some strange, weird American cult. I've actually lived outside the US much longer than I've lived in it, despite my accent. And some of you probably feel the same. But our mission is really something that people at Facebook all over the world deeply believe in. It does not sit neglected in some dusty drawer. It's a constant reference point for what we do every day and how we think about our company and our work and our role in the world. As we've grown, Facebook has become a central part of the experience of being online. It's where people go on the best days and on the worst days. They express how they feel and experience things from new perspectives. And increasingly, it's where people go to find out what's happening in the world around them. 
we recognize that this puts us in a very unique position. With so many people using our platform to stay in touch and stay informed, we think a lot about our impact on the, on the world and about our role. We are aware that with influence comes responsibility. And we're constantly working to make sure our platform is a place where anyone can share what matters to them, a place that's as diverse and representative as the people who use it and the world it reflects. But operating at that scale is complex. A glance at almost any international negotiation or global institution shows that it takes time to get global projects right. An example, in the 15 years since the Doha round of the World Trade Organization negotiations beginning, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Uber, Twitter, they were all created. So were the iPhone and Google Maps. And in a world where everyone has a voice, we're exposed to a much wider range of opinions. And different countries and cultures have radically different understandings of what's acceptable and what's not. I'm addressing a group here of some of the most progressive editors in a progressive corner of a very progressive continent. The norms in which you operate here in Norway are distinctive and valuable, and we should strive to build a service that respects and accompanies them as much as possible. But we can't say that they are more valuable than the norms of the rest of our community, or nor can we build a wall between your cult culture and others. We seek to connect the world, to provide a platform for a truly global community. And in the case of the Terror of War photo, we listen to feedback from all parts of the world when making our policies. What appears to be clear cut in one country can be muddy in another. We have to assemble teams with diverse global perspectives to deal with controversial content. We all recognize the cultural resonance of the terror of war photo, which comes from a conflict in which the West was involved. But would we instinctively know the defining image from the Eritrean Ethiopian war? Would we instantly grasp the subtleties of a post about the Colombian rebels? Or do we have the same understanding of what constitutes hate speech in Thailand? Sometimes there are direct physical consequences to our policies. A post that is mildly provocative in one country might lead us to being completely blocked in another country, perhaps shutting off access for tens of millions of people. Do we value freedom of expression in one country over the right to communicate in another? A graphic video of a terrorist attack is shared. Will it inspire people to copy the violence or to unite to stop it? Our best answer to these problems is to apply global community standards, guidelines that create a safe environment for people to share and provide the most voice to the most people. People are free to write, publish, and share whatever they please everywhere else. But content shared on Facebook must meet these community standards. We don't allow violent or hateful speech against people based on their beliefs, color of skin, or sexual orientation. We don't allow praise for terrorist acts or violent organizations. We don't allow beheadings or efforts to groom children for abuse or bullying or and bullying of private individuals. We do support and defend the broadest interpretation of freedom of speech. Although we support an open internet and the many opportunities for expression that it provides, Facebook is not the internet. We are not the beginning and the end of free expression. But increasingly, we're seen as a proxy for the internet and the social, technological, and economic change that it brings. So as we try to build a service that anyone can use, we have to confront some very hard questions about what a global platform really is. We have to figure out how to both give people a voice and also counter hatred. We have to understand how cultures and outlooks can coexist on truly global platforms where speech is no longer bound by geography or language. We have to work to understand what freedom of expression means in a world where everyone is connected. The tension between allowing difficult ideas while protecting the right of expression for all is nothing new. It's at the heart of constitutions and social contracts all over the world. And the fear of the corrupting influence of new technology is also nothing new. A New York Times foreign correspondent elegantly wrote about how we used to live with spaces between continents and walls between houses. Now we live in one room where there can be no silence, 
no secrets, no really aloof or primitive people. Perhaps that explains all the furious fence building, the fanned up nationalism, the angers and neuroses of our time. Her name was Anne O'Hare McCormick, and she was writing about that new consumer technology called the radio in 1932. The respected Swiss scientist Conrad Gessner said the overabundance of information brought about by a radical new technology would confuse and harm the minds of people. He was referring to the printing press in the 16th century. So it goes all the way back to Socrates and his warning that the written word, the very alphabet, will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls in the 400 BC. What is new is the internet's reach. Today it's possible to instantly reach millions with single images or sentences, for better or for worse. Learning how to manage this tension in a truly global community is a new problem, and it's one we spend a lot of time on. We care about getting it right. We can't just walk away from the task. With community standards, real people, without the community standards, real people would suffer real harm. Bear in mind, the policies that led us to remove the terror of war photo were designed to prevent the spread of imagery that harms children and costs lives. Sometimes we get it wrong, and we hear lots of feedback from people no matter which path we choose. But our job isn't to avoid that task, it's to do it right. Our community operations team work constantly to stop hateful or violent content from spreading on our platforms. With more than two billion posts on Facebook every single day, this is a very big job. And not only do we face new types of content that generate new policy challenges like Facebook Live, we also handle the borderline cases that all platforms struggle with, like the image of the Syrian child, Alan Kurdi, on the beach in Turkey, which was spread very widely on Facebook. We debate the difficult policy choices internally, and I think we can do a better job of communicating those decisions openly. We recognize our responsibility to the people who use our platforms, and we design our policies and products with this responsibility in mind. We have rules about what content we take down, and we improve our policies based on feedback from the community, as with the terror of war photo. That brings me to how we think about news on Facebook. First, we do not think of ourselves as editors. We believe it's essential that Facebook stay out of the business of deciding what issues the world should read about. That's what editors do on TV, in newspapers, in magazines and journals, on blog posts and websites. But we do retain the right to take things down when they violate our community standards. As the caretaker of a platform where anyone can immediately share anything with everyone, we do have the responsibility to make sure that what is shared in a liberal society like Norway or Denmark will not put people at risk in other countries. Giving a blanket pass to all editors would bring its own problems. Should we give the same authority to all editors, regardless of circulation, type of media, country of origin? News organizations in different parts of the world have very different standards for publishing. What makes the editorial pages in some regions is considered hate speech or blasphemy in others. So where do we draw the line? The newsfeed algorithm uses people's actions and preferences to reflect their interests back to them. The single biggest thing that determines, determines what's in your newsfeed are the choices that you make, the, papal, the people in the pages that you choose to follow. Those choices do take place in a framework that we've created. The algorithms that determine what shows up in newsfeed are guided by our newsfeed values. Friends and family come first. Posts and stories should be informative, entertaining, and genuine. We don't favor specific sources or ideas. We give people controls so they can customize what they see. We'll always release details of any changes we make to the newsfeed and how they will affect content. We've also made a number of policy changes after the terror of war photo. We've improved our escalation process to ensure that controversial stories and images get surfaced more quickly. In the weeks ahead, we're going to begin allowing more items that people find newsworthy, significant, or important to the public interest, even if they might otherwise violate our standards. 
We'll work with our community and partners to explore exactly how to do this, both through new tools and approaches to enforcement. Our intent is to allow more images and stories without posing safety risks or showing graphic images to minors or others who don't want to see them. Allowing one particular photo is the easy part. Figuring out how to make it happen consistently at scale without breaking our promise to keep people safe is much harder. Second, on the business side, we're working with our media partners to help them find new and engaging ways to tell stories, reach bigger audience, and experiment with new technologies that we develop. That includes new products like Instant Articles, which load faster, hold people's attention for longer, have better reach, and more advertising options. We're improving the rules around advertising and Instant Articles to help publishers make more money per article. That was the number one feedback that we received from all of our partners, help us make more money. And we're looking also to provide better dashboards so publishers can get the kind of insights that advertisers can get about how their stories are performing. We've just launched facebook.com slash journalists to give people best practices and help them learn how to use the tools at Facebook to build audiences. We also are opening up our Signal app, which allows journalists to explore what's trending on Facebook and Instagram before things go viral. We're not interested in publishing or creating content ourselves. We need the incredible journalism that you create because that is the one thing, one of the many things that people come to Facebook to read about, to share, and to talk about. There's a very large audience of people that love to see the quality news that you produce in their news feeds. As a technology company, we can play an important role in helping you as publishers and media producers make sure that your work reaches them. We can and should be partners in helping people find and engage with the stories they care about. So we're investing in our media partnerships team to give publishers more support. In fact, I've just posted a new position on my team heading up the media partnerships in the Nordics. If you have any recommendations, please let me know. We're making these investments because we know that right now the future of journalism and the future of Facebook are intertwined. Because the shift away from one sector owning both creation and distribution is affecting business models for publishers. Because we hear the request for more transparency. Because we know that sections of the media face challenges too. Some news organizations miss the technological and demographic shift that the internet represents. They did not capitalize on the new relationships with and new expectations of their readers, many of which have been silent for a very long time. They didn't build businesses that could be competitive in a mobile, digital, and connected world. But above all, we believe that the news industry contributes something irreplaceable to our society, and we're here to help. We recognize the critical role you play in healthy democracies. We respect your editorial independence, the difficult decisions that you make every day, and the need for a strong, independent news media that can make the long-term investment in journalism that allows people to hold the powerful to account. In return, we ask that you understand the community standards, these guidelines that we've built our products upon, and the reasons they exist, and that, most of all, you continue to work with us to help us improve them when necessary. On our side, we will be open. We already published details of any changes we make to the newsfeed ranked stories, and you can see them by going to our blog. And we'll continue to communicate. We're going to listen. We're going to engage. We're going to be part of the conversation. That's why I'm here today and why we're also working with many of you in the industry. Over the past few weeks, I've helped conduct workshops in several different countries, including the UK and Spain. We're hosting a workshop for you tomorrow, and we have more in Berlin, Paris, and Copenhagen before the end of the month. These efforts matter because the internet is still unfinished. It's a new public space that's still being understood, whose norms are still being defined. And it belongs to all of us. Making sure it works requires us all. Media companies, technology companies, governments, civil society. Facebook is, of course, just one part of the internet. And we take our responsibility for that part very seriously. But we should work together to promote open conversation, counter negative speech, 
and build a culture of respect that will make sure the internet remains a positive and productive place as it grows. We can and we will get this right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take the questions later. Thank you, Patrick. You we'll sample up all the good questions for the session afterwards. So write them down, we'll be ready.